Okay, we got a 2005 Chevy Impala with a 3400 engine, 3.4 liter. Symptoms, check engine light is on and the owner claims that it will not start in the mornings, especially when it's cold outside. And he has to spray starting fluid in the intake to get it to run and then it will continue to run and it runs okay. And of course he has a little bit of a long crank time too, even when it starts. Okay, here's a shot of the trouble codes that are on this. The one that we're concerned about for his symptoms would be the crank sensor issue. That engine oil pressure switch is gonna have nothing to do with how this car starts. So we wanna focus, I think, on this crank sensor trouble code first. Okay, quick word on this crank sensor trouble code. There are two crank sensors on this engine. There is a 24X crank signal and there's a 7X crank signal. And what we don't know right now is which sensor that code is pointing to toward. If we knew, we could go right to the sensor without a flow chart and, and go about our business, whether it be a Hall Effect or a VRS type sensor and do our regular checks. But what we need to know first is which sensor is that? And then also a little bit of theory and operation on which sensor does what and why it's there. It's very important. So we gotta do some homework first and see what we have and then we'll do some checks on the sensor. Okay, we pulled some information off of Mitchell on this crankshaft position sensor A circuit malfunction. Uh, I cut off the top up here, the trouble code number, but it was a PO335 just to review that. And I'm not gonna follow this flowchart word for word, but even though I'm trying to shortcut using flowcharts in a lot of my videos, what I use these flowcharts for is for information purposes. And so at the top of this, it gives me a nice description of what this crankshaft position sensor A circuit is. Now I already know this, but this is where you guys need to go dig for your information. The description here for this sensor, it's a 24X crank sensor, and that means that there's 24 pulses per crankshaft rotation. The other thing with this, what we need to know, this having two crankshaft position sensors, a 24X and a 7X, is if this one fails, will this match my symptoms? And the symptoms for this gentleman, again, is he has to use starting fluid in the morning when it's cold, and it's fine the rest of the day, but he still has some cranking issues, long crank time. If you look at the description of the sensor, it says the PCM uses this, I have it highlighted here, the PCM uses the 24X signal for enhanced smoothness and idle stability at lower engine speeds. So that's the primary function of this sensor. This sensor is not used for spark control on this engine. You're gonna to have to take my word on that. The 7X crank signal is our main one, and that's a variable reluctance sensor. This one, this 24X crank, is a Hall effect. I have another video on checking this same sensor. You guys can look for that too. We're checking a 24X crankshaft position sensor. The other thing this sensor is used for, and it's not listed here, is for misfire monitoring. When they went OBD2 with this 3400, 3100 engine, they added this 24X crank signal. And they actually added it, I think, right before OBD2, but it is used for misfire monitoring too. We need to have more teeth between cylinder firings to be able to monitor those frequency changes of the, of the crankshaft. So that's primary function of the sensor, and I'm saying that this symptom that we have with starting fluid, long crank, does not match this sensor. In fact, this engine will run with this sensor unplugged. However, I still want to attack it because what I find is when you have a fault code, even if it's not related directly, it may be indirectly related to what our problem is and we can backtrack from there and maybe find our problem. So we're gonna attack this 24X crank sensor now. As I did in another video, we're gonna check the signal if we have no signal, we're gonna check the power, we're gonna check the ground. Another nice thing in this flowchart is it tells me that the PCM provides 12 volts, so our power for this Hall effect is supplied by the PCM. It's a 12 volt feed from the computer, and the computer also provides the ground for the sensor. 
A little bit of insight that's not here is this is a 12 volt pull up design hall effect. I've talked about pull up and pull down circuitry in a bunch of other videos. This is a 12 volt pull up design, meaning the sensor generates the signal, sends it to the computer. It's not the other way around where the computer supplies a voltage to the sensor and the sensor pulls that to ground to make the square wave. This one, it's a pull up design. So we're gonna go to the sensor next, see what it looks like. Okay, just a quick shot of where this 24X crank sensor connector is. It's right next to the oil filter. What we're gonna do is just try to speed this up a little bit. We're not gonna worry about which wire's which and go into the diagram and figuring out which one's signal, power and ground. We're just gonna check all three for a signal. This is what I do whenever I'm in the field and I don't have a wiring diagram is I am going to check all three wires for a signal. We know it's a Hall effect. We should have a square wave on one of these three wires. So from this point on, I'm just gonna focus us on the scope and we'll be moving the T-pin accordingly across this connector and see what we got. All right, we're on one of the three wires for this crank sensor, go ahead and crank it. All right, let's leave it run. No reason to keep cranking it, yeah. All right, as you can see in this, we have nothing. So this could be normal. Could be a normal ground, that is, no, no signal. So, but that's our first of the three wires. We got nothing there. We're gonna move the T-pin now to the next wire over. Here's our second wire. We got a 2.3 volt flat line on that. I don't like that wire at all. Let's go to the third one. We got a 2.7 volt flat line on that one. So, number one, we don't have a square wave like we should. We got no signal here, so we're accurate so far in chasing the right sensor. Number two, as according to our diagram and from other 24X crank sensor videos I've done, there's no 12 volt feed on this sensor. We have two volts as a supply. Now I'm not sure which one of these, the 2.3 or the 2.7 is the supply, but our focus now is gonna go toward the supply voltage to this sensor. Okay, we're still on the wire. Uh, this one reads 2.3 volts now. I think we were at 2.7, then we shut it off. We're at 2.3, but what we're trying to do is twofold. One, we're not sure which one of the two volt wires was the signal and which one was the feed. We want to focus on the feed wire. What we want to do now is unplug the sensor and see what happens to this voltage. If we unplug the sensor and, and our feed comes back to 12, we have a shorted sensor. If we unplug the sensor and our feed stays at two, then we have a wiring or computer problem. Also, this being a pull-up design, when I unplug the sensor, one of the two wires that read two volts is gonna drop to zero. That's your signal wire. So we're doing some voltage test to tell us, one, how's the sensor condition, and two, which one the signal wire was. So I'm on, I am on the green wire on this sensor right now. I'm gonna go back to the middle wire real quick, which is the blue one. Got 2.4 volts on the blue one. I'm gonna unplug it on this blue wire. So I'm unplugging the sensor, staying on the harness side of the sensor. And you see my voltage drop to zero. So now I know which one my signal wire is, being this is a pull up design circuit. That sensor was trying to produce a signal, but the voltage is too low for it to do its job. Back to my green wire, which is now what we know is our sensor feed. And you see we have 2.6 volts on that wire, so now we also know that we do not have a bad sensor. If this sensor was bad and pulling this 12 volt feed to ground 
When we unplugged the sensor, this would have come back to 12. We do not have a bad sensor. Our next step, we have to check that same green wire, which is our feed, at the computer. So now we gotta focus on the diagram, look at the green wire, find the pin on the computer, do our voltage check there. Okay, we're on our same green wire at the computer. We did some diagram research, pin numbers, sequencing. I've shown this in other videos. And the result of this test is gonna tell us whether or not we have a wiring problem or a computer problem. We have the sensor still unplugged, so we know the sensor's out of the picture. We should have 12 volts on this wire. If we have 12 volts here at the computer and two volts at the sensor, we have corrosion resistance problem in this wire. If we have two volts here and two volts out there, we either have a partial short to ground or we have a computer problem. So let's see what we got. Okay, I switched my scope to a multimeter scale because I just wanted a nice big number for the camera. I think I. I was having a little trouble picking up those smaller numbers. But there's our 2.6 volts on this same wire going to that crank sensor. And so what that means is our wire is intact. It's not an open in the circuit. But before we go in the direction of a computer problem on this car, we need to make sure that we check this green wire for a short to ground. So a short to ground test is next. Okay, so we said in the last segment that our wire is not open and our concern is a short to ground or it is a computer issue. Knowing the computer sends 12 volts to feed this sensor, we have two volts on the circuit. What we've done, can't really tell with the camera here, but we've unbolted half of this computer. We need the computer isolated so that connector is no longer connected to the computer. You have to do that. You have to isolate the circuit to do short to ground tests. The sensor's disconnected, the computer's disconnected. We're gonna ohm this wire. So we have a, our yellow lead going to the wire itself and we have our black lead to a known good ground. We're doing a short to ground test. And I'm using just a regular meter here for this and you can see that I am reading OL M ohms, which is my mega ohm scale, which is millions of ohms of resistance saying that we are out of limit or out of range of this mega ohm scale, there is no short to ground on this feed wire. So we have a computer problem. What we do not want to do is put a computer in this car yet. We need to check our computer powers and grounds next. That's where we're going. Okay, we did our power and ground check. I'm not going to go through each wire that we did and the, and the numbers we have. I'll show you the numbers we wrote down on a piece of paper. I've shown how to do power and ground checks on a computer before. In one of my first videos, there's a three-part video on a Jeep. It's a Jeep no-start diagnosis, part one, part two, and part three. And in that video, I'm showing how to do computer power and ground tests. I've done this also on other cars with bad computer grounds. I have quite a few up that I've shown how to do power and ground tests. So I'm not gonna show it again. I have just one power feed right now on here, or my students do, thank you guys. And uh, we're reading 11.9 volts. Our battery's weak, we actually have a jump pack on here. But this is pretty typical, all of our feeds were good. My suspicions were wrong. I actually thought we were gonna find a power feed problem that kinda tied into our no start intermittent no start and what we found yesterday when we were playing around with this is when it didn't start you know all I had was a test light with me at the moment it was end of the day it looked like we were losing injection pulse and when I put a battery charger on the car the battery was weak but it was cranking when I put a charger on the car it fired right up so I, I my suspicions were we had a power feed issue to this PCM and we don't so what does a low power feed on this 24x crank sensor have to do with the no start it really has nothing to do with it, but if we have one circuit on this computer that's malfunctioning, it is very real possibility that we have multiple issues with this engine computer, and we're gonna need to address that first. Let me get you a shot on our wiring diagram of what our voltage numbers were. Okay, so what we did, we went through the diagram, and nice of Mitchell to lay these out for us like this, is we have our, our designated pins, they give us not just the pin number and color, but what it does. So there's an ignition feed, we're at 12.1 on that on this page. On our other computer diagram, this is the other half of the computer, there's a ground, we're at 0 .04, 12 volts on an ignition feed, 12 volts on a battery feed, 
and the rest of our grounds, 0 .04, 0 .04 down the board. So we did voltage drop tests on the grounds, which I've shown in other videos the importance of that. The one I'm thinking of is my Toyota Echo no start or no communication case study where we had a bad computer ground and we identified that using a voltmeter, not an ohm meter. So powers and grounds are good. What's left, we checked this crank sensor wire that was this, this green one on our, on our page here. We, we checked this wire for opens, we checked it for shorts. The computer is responsible for supplying voltage to this sensor on that wire. And we had two volts, supposed to be 12. So what's left is, again, checking the wire, opens and shorts, they're good. And then focusing on the computer, we checked our main powers, we checked our main grounds, and there's really nothing else we can do other than put a computer in this. And anytime you put a computer in a car, there's always a question. There's, there's really hardly ever a time where you put a computer in a car and you feel absolutely 110% confident that you didn't miss something. And that's what it feels like. I'm not sure, did we miss anything? What are we, you know, we go through it again in our mind. What did we miss? Is there anything else we can check? Is there any other shared circuits that could be interfering with this? And I have to tell you offhand, I can't think of one. Uh, uh, as I'm speaking, I'm thinking of the cam sensor and uh, I'm wondering, I know this cam sensor is also a 12 volt pull up design and the computer feeds the cam sensor too. Be curious to see what this cam sensor signal looks like. See if we have low voltage on that too. And if that's the case, that would definitely give me no injection pulse during cranking. I've seen these 3400 engines have no injection pulse during cranking with no cam signal. So as I'm sitting here talking, filming this, saying we're putting a computer in this car. And of course, we'll film the after. We won't let this one go. We'll get a computer for this and film that. I, I wanna check this cam sensor now. Powers and grounds are good. Wiring's good, and I guess what I'm thinking about as far as the cam sensor goes, what if, and this is a hypothetical, but what if the cam sensor shares that same 12 volt feed source in the computer? And, and one of the tests we did on the crank sensor was to unplug the crank sensor, right? We, we disconnected the sensor and we wanted to make sure that the sensor wasn't shorted to ground. What we were looking for when we were at two volts, we unplugged the sensor, we wanted to see it go to 12. What if by some chance the cam sensor could be shorted out doing the same thing and we unplug the cam sensor and our crank sensor now comes up to 12 and we have a shorted cam sensor. And see, I don't know for sure if that's possible, but I do know that my cam sensor is, is, is here too and I just wanna check it. I, I, I wanna get that out of the, out of the mix. I, I don't wanna guess. When it comes to putting a few hundred dollar computer in a car, three, four hundred dollars probably on this and then a reprogram. Uh, I want to be a hundred percent sure. Let's check the cam sensor. I'm going to do some cam sensor testing now and we've chosen a location on this bulk connector behind the alternator. This is the same connector that has all of your fuel injector wiring in. And the reason we're going in this location is the cam sensor lives underneath the power steering pump and you can't get to the connector on the cam sensor. So we're going to measure it right there. Let me get you a shot real quick of the wiring diagram and where we're connected. We're actually on a, what color is our wire? Right now we're on a pink and black. Mm -hmm. Pink and black is the signal wire that we're on on the computer side of this connector. Okay, on the wiring diagram we have a little bit of a, an issue with wire colors that change and if you look at the sensor it goes green, red and black same as the crank actually the green red black the red is our feed wire that was showing two volts on the crank and it changed to a light green on the harness side the red which would be the feed on the cam changes to a red white then comes up to another connector that's this one right here that's the one we're at it changes from a red white to a red and the signal goes from black and it's black on this sub harness connector and then it changes to a pink and black. So that's where we're T-pinned right there on this side. We're on a pink black wire which is our signal wire for the cam sensor. And the next shot we're gonna do the red white wire which is our feed if we do not have a cam signal. Okay, we're on the cam sensor signal. Got our scope set up. 
graphing multimeter on a 10 second scale. This isn't a very fast signal. Go ahead and start it. There we go. Our start stall. You see we have no signal on this at all. So our cam sensor signal is also dead. That would explain our injection issue that we saw originally. Can you shut that off for me, please? So remember the original symptoms here. This guy that owns his vehicle, he's using starting fluid in the morning to get this thing started. And what we found when we had it a no start at one point in time is we were losing injection pulse. This cam sensor signal is involved with the injectors and so that kind of matches that. It's surprising that this vehicle starts, truthfully. It's also surprising that we didn't have a cam sensor trouble code in memory. Now we could go back to the scan tool and we can look at the cam sensor data on the scan tool, but at this point it's really not necessary. We know this signal's not here. Let's stay focused on where we are, which is low voltage on our crankshaft position sensor circuit. Is this tied together? What I wanna do now, I wanna check the feed on this cam sensor, just like we did the crank, and it also uses a 12 volt feed from the computer. Just gonna move our T-pin over one to a solid red wire, and on the other side it was red and white, is that correct? It moved, it changed color on us? Yes. So that's my feed wire for my cam, and I'll get you focused back on the scope here. And there's our same 2.3 volts that we had on our crank sensor. And our concern this whole time was, is there some other circuit that is shared that is sharing this 12 volt feed for the crank. And what we're seeing is there is. This cam, to me, if I see low voltage on the same feed wire, now it's not the same wire externally from the computer, we're pretty confident it is shared internally. Both feed circuits we're seeing low voltage on for the cam and for the crank. So what we wanna do now, and we have the ability to do this, we are on the harness side of this connector we're going to unplug the connector, which is going to isolate the cam sensor from this picture. One of the steps we did when we started checking the crank was when we saw low voltage on the crank, it was to unplug the sensor, make sure the sensor wasn't shorted out, pulling that voltage to ground. We're going to do the same thing on the cam sensor. We're going to do it at this bulkhead connector. Okay, from that last clip, I just changed my scales here. We're looking at a full scale 20 volt, I was on a 10, just in case that this works. We want to be able to see that level and not bury the screen. You can watch this number down here, this 2.4 volts. I'm going to come over here and unplug this bulk connector. My T-pin still staying in there. Nice. That's freaking awesome. We unplug this bulkhead connector, and so what we've just done is we've isolated the cam sensor signal or the cam sensor from this circuit, and we now have 11.6 volts on this cam sensor feed wire that we had two volts on. And what this is telling us, we have a shorted cam sensor. So what I wanna do now is I wanna go back to the crank sensor and look at that crank sensor feed wire when I'm doing this same test. Just a quick shot of the crank sensor again. My T-pin is on the feed wire to this sensor. Get you back up to the scope, we get a voltage reading. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna unplug this bulk connector up here on the alternator, next to the alternator. I'm gonna unplug this connector, which is where my cam sensor signal comes through, isolating the cam sensor from the circuit. We're gonna unplug that connector while we're connected at the feed for the crank while we are watching the scope. Okay, again, I apologize for this glare. I'm, I'm doing the best that I can here. Hopefully you can make out that voltage value on the screen. We're looking at 2.5 volts, 2.5 volt flat line. I'm gonna reach over and unplug the bulk connector for the cam 
Remember that I'm not connected over here, I'm connected on the crank. Well, that is not an easy connector to unplug. Wow. Think about how close we were to putting a computer in this car. This car does not need a computer. We have a shorted cam sensor that's pulling this crank sensor circuit to ground. Nowhere in the wiring diagram do you see that, that this is a shared circuit. And nowhere in the flow chart do we see this. I'm gonna take you back to the flow chart in the diagram and explain one more time what we found. This vehicle has a shorted cam sensor that is setting this 24X crank sensor code that was pulling the voltage down, that's causing the long crank times, and the intermittent no injection pulse shorted cam sensor. Okay, back to this diagram just to show you guys how separate these circuits are. You can see your, your cam sensor signal, the feed for the cam again is this one. This red with a white, that's the one we were on. Goes right to the computer and the feet, and it goes into the computer as a red wire on pin 72. And the feed for the crank is a light green, and it goes into the computer on pin 70. So those two power feeds are right next to each other, but not shared externally. You know, some of our reference voltage circuits to our sensors would be shared externally. These ones are not. What they are is shared internally. The computer supplies 12 volts to these two sensors, these two Hall effects, internally. And we're not told that by any of our material. If you follow the flow chart, there is no mention whatsoever of checking this cam sensor circuit. What I can share with you, and I'm not the engineer, but I'm telling you that this is how it's working. Internal to this computer, Right here, these two wires, they're gonna come in, they're gonna be shared, and there's going to be a source coming in, and our source is gonna go across the resistor. And I know it goes across the resistor because if it did not go across a resistor, it'd be a 12 volt feed going across a resistor. If it didn't go across the resistor, we have a shorted cam sensor. So it's a short to ground essentially on this power feed wire. What happens when you short to ground a power feed wire? You either blow a fuse or you melt a circuit. As Soon as we fix our short to ground by unplugging our cam sensor signal, our 12 volt feed comes back. So I know for a fact there's a resistor inside the computer. It's a 12 volt source, but it's going through a resistor, some type of current limiting resistor. As I've said before, engineers, when they build these circuits, highly protected, almost in anticipation of things like this happening. So what's happening with this circuit, with the cam sensor plugged in and shorted out, we are pulling all of this voltage across this current limiting resistor, we're pulling it to ground through the cam sensor. And what's happening is you have 12 on this side of the resistor and you're gonna have two volts on this side because it wasn't a perfect short to ground, it was a partial short and so that same two volts now, we read two volts at the cam sensor on the feed wire right here, and we read two volts at the crank sensor. When you follow this flow chart, they have you disconnect the crank, disconnect the computer, and ohm the signal, not signal, sorry, ohm the feed wire. They have you do the signal too. But to get a perspective, again, you're unplugging the computer, you're unplugging the sensor, and you're checking this feed circuit for opens and shorts. There is no mention of unplugging the cam sensor. There is no mention of this shared circuit. I think probably most people in this circumstance would have put a computer in this car. In fact, we were ready to put a computer in this car. So some lessons here would be if you find yourself ready to change a computer, you need to think about the variables. We checked powers, we checked grounds, those were all good. The other variable here would be shared reference voltages to sensors. I have this in my five volt reference chapter in my book. I think it's 
section nine, the five volt reference circuit where I talk about something similar like this, where you can have a throttle position sensor sort out and it pulls the entire five volt reference to ground. Same kind of situation here with this car. No mention of it in the flow chart. Let me get you a shot of that real quick. Okay, here's the flow chart for this. I'm gonna try to do this as fast as I can. We'll go step by step. Diagnostic system check, that's just codes. Observe the 24X scan tool. This is scan tool test. We know our signal was missing. It's having you observe some freeze frame data, typical beginnings of a flow chart. It's having us start the engine, see if the code comes back. If it does, continue through your checks. And what it has you do first is turn the, turn the core off, disconnect the crank sensor, turn the key on, and measure your 12 volt feed. So we did that and what we had was two volts. And so is, it says, is the voltage measured within one volt? And the answer would be no. So this is in our flow chart. This column is yes. This column is no. So what do we do? We go to step nine. Step number nine has us test the 12 volt reference circuit of the crank for an open or short to ground. And it has us refer to wiring repairs. And all that does is just tell you how to repair a wire. There's no additional information in there. And what you would have found, again, what we would have been doing here is checking this for a open or short would involve taking this, what I have highlighted green in this diagram, unplugging the computer, unplugging the sensor. And we did this in our video. We checked it for, we weren't so much worried about an open because we had two volts at the sensor and we had two volts at the computer. So we knew that we didn't have an open. We checked it for a short to ground. There was O, L, M, ohm, so infinity, no short to ground on the green wire. So, following the flow chart with that result, test for an open or short. Did you find and correct the condition? Again, this is the yes column, this is the no column. So no, we did not. We go to step 15. Make sure I'm doing that right. Did you find and correct the condition? Answer is no. 15 is gonna have you checking for intermittence. So we're, this really takes you from the point of testing the feed to maybe it's an intermittent problem. So no for this one again would put us to 17, replace the PCM, replace the PCM. If you wanted to follow the rest of these just to be sure we didn't miss something and maybe follow it wrong, test the low reference circuit for an open, that's our ground, we know our ground's good, we used voltage drop for that. Test the 12 volt reference circuit for high resistance, we're, we're, we know we don't have a problem there too. High resistance of this 12 volt reference would have been two volts at the sensor. At the computer wire, we would have read 12 volts if you had a high resistance problem. So we don't need to do that step because we had two volts at the computer. So it was not a resistance problem. Low reference circuit, that's our ground. We know that's good from voltage. Medium resolution engine speed signal. For an open or short, that's the signal wire itself. By disconnecting the sensor, that eliminates that possibility. So again, all the way through this, guys, there is no mention of checking the cam sensor for a short on this feed circuit. You follow this flow chart, guys. This is exactly what you're gonna be doing right here. Replace the PCM. This is exactly what we were going to do, and it was just field experience knowing about reference circuits from other sensors and other components and we maybe got a little bit lucky you know in talking about it we thought about that what is another variable so good lesson on computer replacement there isn't one test that says you need to replace the computer you need to think outside of the box and it definitely helps to know system designs it was critical that i knew that both cam and crank sensors were 12 volts supplied by the computer and that they were both pull up design circuits from past experience on these vehicles. So I hope you guys like that one. Bad cam sensor. I'm hoping to get a cam sensor put in this to finish this video up. 
I don't think it's necessary for what we saw that we definitely do not need a computer and we have a sorted cam sensor. Now there is a slight possibility that that cam sensor wire is touching ground underneath that power steering pump. We won't know until we move it anyway. We're gonna move it, get a cam sensor, we'll check the harness real close. But that is definitely a fix. It does not need a computer, sorted cam sensor, or circuit under the power steering pump. Okay, this is a shot of our cam sensor where it's located after we moved the power steering pump out of the way. One of our concerns, and we couldn't tell with the power steering pump in the way, one of our concerns was the harness with this whole process. Worried about the harness being shorted to ground and take a look at this, the wiring for this sensor, they're all touching each other. And so what we had is really not a bad sensor, but we had a short in the wiring. So what we're gonna have to do is fix the wiring. We're gonna replace the sensor anyway because we're here. In fact, that is the new sensor that's in there. We just didn't put the bolt in yet. All we did was a quick visual inspection on this harness and you know, there it is. What caused it? Looks like oil was leaking here for a period of time and deteriorated the insulation on the wires and that's what happens sometimes. So we need to fix that as best we can, which is gonna be using some heat shrink and separating these wires, probably pulling them out of the connector, the pins out of the connector and then slipping heat shrink, heat shrink over these wires. That's how we're gonna do it. Here's another shot of that harness. We have it kind of up and out of the way. Can you keep your eye on that and make sure that I'm still in the screen with my hands for this? What I'm gonna do, we have good insulation back in here and what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop the electrical terminals out of this connector and then run heat shrink down the wires. Electrical tape's not gonna hold up in this environment. So what I've done is I popped this green cap out of the connector here. And from there, what we'll have access to is the tabs that lock our female terminals in place. We'll pop these out one at a time, run the heat shrink over, and then put it back together. So that's what we're doing. Okay, I just pulled one out so far. Very easy tab to release. There's just simply a, a clip. I was actually able to use my fingernail and open it up. Pulled the terminal out. We'll be able to slide our heat shrink over top of this without having to cut the wire and solder. A lot better method for fixing this. Quick shot of our fix. We used some heat shrink. Not the best heat shrink in the world, but better than uh, just using electrical tape, especially in this oily environment. And what we're going to do too is we're going to wrap this up also with electrical tape and a piece of conduit, if we can find a piece of conduit laying around. That would be even better. And then we'll plug it in, put it back together, see what we got. We should be good to go. Okay, there's our piece of conduit we used over top of the heat shrink. We're gonna get this plugged back into the sensor, get this all back together, and we should be, should be good to go. Last shot for this video is gonna be the fix, which is we're going to listen to the engine and the way it starts before we had a start stall and Cold engine, no starting, which we had narrowed down to injection pulse. And the second thing is gonna to be to look at this waveform on the screen. So my, my yellow trace is gonna be my 24X signal and my green trace is my cam signal. Go ahead and start that. Set that back off. Don't hold it in the crank position this time, just just crank it, let it go, because it should crank on its own and stop on its own. Uh, yep. Good. Got a little bit of engine noise on this thing, but that is a fix. Almost put a computer in this car for a couple of shorted wires that had absolutely nothing to do with the flow chart. There was no mention of it on the flow chart. I think a good lesson on this is anytime you have a sensor that has a reference or power feed wire 
that is low voltage, you always think about other sensors that are sharing that circuit that may be pulling it to ground. And even if they're not shared on the wiring diagram, they can be shared internally by the computer. Be careful, this was a really good lesson on that. That is a fix.